Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Source Bio International PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your question in the box below and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand over to Jay LeCue, Chairman, Tony Radcliffe, CFO, and Russell Wheatcroft, COO of Source Bioscience International PLC. Good afternoon to you, Jay. Good afternoon, Mark. Thanks for, thanks for the intro, and thanks, everyone, for, for joining the call. Uh, I'm Jay LeCue. I'm the uh, Executive Chairman of uh, Source uh, Bio. I joined the company in 2016 as non-exec chairman. And in early 2017, it became clear we needed to do a little more to improve the performance of the business, and the board asked me to come in as executive chair. Uh, as a, a bit of a background on, on uh, my experience, I've got over 20 years uh, experience, uh, particularly focused on UK-listed life science companies. Uh, I was a commercial director for BioQuel uh, from 2016 to 2019. Great experience. The board asked Ian Johnson and myself to come in and help uh, improve the business. Uh, good news was by the time uh, it was by the time we exited at 590p, it was up from 146p when we joined after three years. So a big win for investors and just a great experience to uh, to help uh, you know improve that business. I think more applicable to Source is my experience with Celsus International a PLC. And I'm, I'm not sure how familiar some of you may be with Celsus, but it was one of the first companies floated on the London Stock Exchange back in the biotech boom in the late 90s. I joined in 95, and by 2000 was asked to. To take uh, to run the company when we were in the in the midst of a pretty serious financial uh, situation, uh, we were losing money, we couldn't raise money, and we were and we were out of money. Um, so we needed to make some pretty quick decisions on exiting non-core businesses, shuttering uh, facilities that weren't performing, uh, removing uh, poor performing product lines, raising prices where we could. So a lot of a lot of decisions made in a very short amount of time. But the good news was that by 2003. Uh, we were awarded best performing share on the Techmark Money Science Index, uh, which I always like to say is the only quantifiable award they give out. So it was nice to receive that award. And then, you know, after delivering, uh, you know, double digit earnings growth in 2009, uh, we were approached by one of our large shareholders to take the company private. And we exited in 2015 uh, with an IRR of 48% and a 7.6 uh, times cash return for shareholders. So another uh, you know, nice win for shareholders and also a great experience for the for everyone in the company to have turned it around. And I, I think this is similar to Source in many ways. In fact, I think there's more upside to Source than what we what we saw itself. So I'm very excited to uh, come in and help the business and, and, and share with you today what we're planning on doing as we move forward. Okay, thanks, Jay. A very quick intro for, for me, uh, Tony Ratcliffe, CFO. My background is um, essentially UK Chartered Accountant, MBA as well. Uh, and similarly, 20 plus years of experience actually entirely in technology growth businesses. Uh, all the companies had ambitious expectations and, and similarly, really a, a, a key focus on building shareholder value. Um, I think hopefully my experience is very relevant to, uh, to what Source is going to need. Um, it's quite, quite a good uh, balanced mix, I think, of operational experience, lots of transactional experience and a fair amount of M&A. And, and actually a significant part of that M&A was on the aid market as well. I actually joined the company earlier in the year and absolutely delighted uh, to be part of the team as we uh, continue to grow further. And good afternoon, everybody. My name is Russell Wheatcroft. I'm the COO here at SourceBio, also with 20 years experience in the life sciences sector in senior roles. Uh, I joined SourceBio Science back in 2016, um, but since 2017, I've been working alongside Jay, uh, reshaping the business uh, that you'll see before you today. Uh, I've got a proven track record in increasing revenues, developing and improving operational efficiencies whilst focused fully on margin improvements. My career covers uh, laboratory services, large and small capex equipment sales, and the sale of uh, laboratory and reagent products. Uh, just to give everybody sort of a 10,000 foot view of the business, uh, Source is a leading provider of laboratory services to the pharmaceutical industry, the NHS and private hospitals. Four main areas of the business, pathology testing, DNA sequencing, environmentally controlled storage, and our COVID-19 uh, testing business. We'll get more into detail as we go forward. 
Uh, Source was formerly listed on the main market. We took it private in 2016. And since the, since that time, we've really focused uh, Source on its core high margin services, improving its quality of earnings and investing for future organic growth. We haven't looked at any acquisitions. We've only looked at what, what organically can we do to improve this business. And what I always like to say at this point is, you know, a lot of private equity companies take a business as uh, a private, strip out the costs, flip them in two years with a higher EBITDA. Uh, both Hardwood and Continental Investment Partners have a very different approach. They, they buy quality businesses that have potential, invest in the businesses for, for a, a longer term horizon. And that's what we've done with Source. And you'll see that as we continue the presentation. Uh, core business revenues of uh, a source were almost $20 million in 2019, EBITDA 2.8, mm-hmm. uh, growing EBITDA over the last two years, 47%. And that's been a big focus of, of, uh, of the management team is improving the earnings I mentioned before. Uh, we are uniquely uh, positioned to uh, uh, leverage this COVID-19 testing opportunity, which has already contributed uh, significantly to the business. And I'll let Tony get into that when we talk about the numbers, but it's it's definitely improving our overall business performance. Uh, the IPO uh, was designed to uh, help us uh, scale up our COVID-19 testing services even uh, more quickly. Uh, we did want to simplify uh, our capital structure, eliminate some debt. Uh, I would say execute on strategic acquisitions and then obviously accelerate our organic growth uh, were the main reasons behind the IPO. Uh, just a company snapshot to give you an idea of the relative size of these uh, different businesses, healthcare diagnostics, uh, complete service for cellular pathology and personalized medicine for the NHS and private uh, healthcare providers, uh, about seven and a half million pounds. This business has been growing fairly rapidly, 40% over the last two years. Uh, very solid business for us. One, really sort of one of the core businesses of source early on. Didn't get a lot of investment for a while. We put investment back into this business and seen some really nice growth. Uh, genomics, uh, state-of-the-art DNA sequencing for, you know, pharma and, and academic, four and a half million pounds. We've got a very good uh, uh, plan to grow this business even more, and we'll talk about that when we get into the presentation. Uh, stability storage, uh, eight million pounds, very solid business for us. Uh, interestingly, we've got some opportunities with the, with the vaccine production that's going on, so we'll, we're excited to tell you about that. Uh, and then infectious disease testing, you know, it's new for May, uh, COVID-19 uh, Right now, antigen business, uh, PCR testing business, we'll, we'll talk more about how we're improving that business even as we go. But that business alone is going to dwarf the other three by the end of 20 and certainly by the end of 21. Uh, I just real quickly want to talk about our locations to give you an idea of the size of the, of the, of the business and really the investments that we've made into the business. You've got, uh, we invested in a digital pathology system in Nottingham where we've got our cellular pathology business. Uh, we put a, a new uh, uh, NGS genomics platform in Cambridge, our center of excellence there. Uh, we've got a new stability storage site in San Diego, California. We put some sequencing capabilities there. We invested in Tremore, Ireland, which is a storage site to give it more capacity to store product. Uh, we invested in a new COVID testing lab in Nottingham. That's where we do our, our currently do most of our uh, 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 COVID testing. And so the point of bringing this up is that, you know, the, the, inv- you know, the shareholders have invested in this business. We are well positioned to grow the business from here. Uh, and that's really, you know, just want to point out what I said before about how, how supportive both Harvard and Continental Investment Partners have been in growing the business. Uh, blue chip client base, just, we put this slide together to give you an idea of the, uh, the types of customers that we're supporting and and, uh, and supplying, you know, from a from a quality perspective, this is you know you can see the the quality that we can bring to these companies and the fact that we're working with them underscores the quality that we're offering. Uh, just some just some cross selling opportunities that we've increasingly tried to do between the four business units. You know, if you've got genomics work being done on new drug compounds, it might make sense to store those with us in our in our storage facilities. That's increasingly happening. You can see some of the crossover customers there. Uh, healthcare diagnostics and genomics. If you're doing some tissue sample work with us, which, which example AstraZeneca is doing, they're also doing some genomics work. And there's increasingly a, a bridge between healthcare diagnostics and genomics and back and forth where they we're getting into more personalized medicine. And we think that's going to be a big part of the company's growth going into the future. And then I think it's, it's important to point out healthcare diagnostics and the strength we had there and the impact that had on infectious diseases. I mean, we were already working with the NHS and private hospitals on the cellular pathology side. They had audited our facilities. We were accredited. They knew our, our ISO levels. So when we came to them with a, with a, with a COVID offering, uh, we were very quickly approved uh, to support that effort. In fact, we were the first private uh, testing lab to get a contract with the NHS. Uh, I think that underscores 
you know, the quality level and also the, the ability of us to, uh, of the company to uh, cross all across our businesses. Uh, this is just a history uh, and, and some key management issues. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I think the only thing I'd like to say is, you know, taking the company private in 2016 for about 63 million pounds. Uh, the real plan was to focus on on the core businesses of source. There were there were many businesses that had been, had been acquired over the years. It didn't make a lot of strategic sense. Many were loss making, not well integrated. Uh, we just wanted to exit those businesses and, and start making, you know, start driving the profitability of the business. We simplified the structure simplified the management structure. Uh, we upgraded the sales force. There was a mentality that you could not pay uh, salespeople um, more than uh, bench chemists, for example, and that really doesn't give you a credible sales force. So we upgraded the sales force and the capability there and put together comp plans so people are getting up every day wanting to sell more. Uh, we also put in some multifunctional uh, business units where we have all the stakeholders in the business get together once a month and talk about the business. It had been very siloed. People were throwing things over the wall. And so now we've really got buy-in across our, our whole company as far as what we're trying to do. And I think this has been very important for us working together, especially to create this COVID opportunity. I don't think we could have done it if we didn't have this multifunctional approach. So just some small things, but, but, but relatively big things we've done to improve the performance of the business. Uh, healthcare diagnostics. Uh, let's just, this is sort of a, just a, just a very quick slide on what we do. But I think the, the graphic on the right gives you a, gets you sort of a, a better understanding of what it is we do. So whether it's pre-op or post-op, if you did a tissue uh, specimen taken to see if you've got cancer, you'll get that taken at an NHS hospital or a private hospital. They will send that tissue sample to us. We will process it down, cut it up, put it on a slide, set of slides. We will then send those slides to one of our pathologists who will then take a look at the slides, make a diagnosis, send the slides back to us, we will then put together a report and send it back to the NHS or one of the private hospitals. So it's, it's an outsourced service, but it's a very high-skilled outsource service. Uh, our staff in, in Nottingham is very well trained. Uh, we've got uh, leading pathologists across the UK that really focus on more complex cases. In fact, we've got uh, one of the largest uh, consultant pathologist networks in the UK outside the NHS. And we are one of the leading outsource partners for uh, cellular pathology uh, to the NHS servicing over 130 departments and private healthcare providers, as we've talked about. Uh, future growth is expected to accelerate by uh, the return of these elective surgeries that have been put on hold uh, due to COVID. In fact, uh, one thing we wanted to point out today is we just received news that we have been accepted into the, the framework to uh, alleviate these elective surgeries. In fact, Russell, do you want to uh, comment on uh, what we just found out, uh, I believe, today or yesterday? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We received a letter today from uh, the DHSC, Department of Health and Social Care, informing us that we have been accepted within the framework agreement. That's the £10 billion framework that the government are looking to fund uh, to obviously beat down those uh, large uh, waiting lists that Jay's referred to. Uh, so this puts us in a, in a very strong position to alleviate the um, uh, co um, contracts and uh, relationships that we have uh, with NHS sites for them to be able to pass more work out to us while centrally funded by the government. So we're excited about the potential to be part of that framework. Uh, there's, a, there's a personalized medicine aspect to this business that I talked about before, and we'll get into that in, in a minute. One thing I did want to point out is our investment in digital pathology. Uh, if, if, if you remember when I discussed this graphic on the right, I, I intentionally talked about the slides. And what digital pathology does is effectively eliminate the slides from that, 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 that graphic and that, that process. So now you'll have a digital system in Nottingham. We will, take, we will obviously process the tissue, but take a digitized image. We will not be putting them on slides to send to a pathologist. He will, we will send him a digitized image. He will make a diagnosis of the digitized image, and we will then prepare a report based on that digitized image. So it really takes the slides out, which, which one, improves uh, you know, our cost base, so don't have to deal with slides, two, the courier time back and forth, uh, so that will improve our turnaround time. And it also enables our, our pathologists to focus, again, more on these higher level complex cases because with digital pathology is an AI system that screens out more of the base cases that are clearly cancer, no cancer. So it really enables us to increase our capacity in a way that we couldn't do without digital. So we're very excited about uh, moving this forward and getting this up and running, uh, not only in, in, uh, in Nottingham, but, but really across the UK. Uh, 
some of the market dynamics and growth potential, you know, we've one of the things I didn't touch on and I probably should have in the slide before is why are we seeing this growth? Well, there's a shortage of pathologists in the UK. It's actually not just the UK. It's where it's worldwide where there aren't enough new pathologists coming into the practice or to the discipline to to, uh, you know, to replace the, the ones that are retiring. Uh, there are restrictions in NHS funding uh, for staffs and, and technology. There's an aging population. We've all heard about that. Uh, evolving case complexity requiring additional work that's due to the technology improvements in cancer diagnostics. And then the significant backlog of patients uh, that we talked about, that's, that's definitely coming. Uh, 10 million when we started presenting this, it's, I think it's, it's I, last time I read it was 15 million. Uh, and we do believe the market is moving to digital pathology, uh, as, as we mentioned, and we are helping lead the way in doing that. Uh, one of the things that we, we wanted to talk about more uh, it was this personalized medicine approach that we're, that we're getting into and really using it to bridge uh, pathology with our genomics business. In fact, Russell, do you want to comment on uh, one of our particular products that we're, we're excited about that we're just launching this year? Yes, yeah, certainly. So, I mean, as you say, Jay, the move to, to, towards personalised medicine is certainly gathering some significant pace, and that's currently driven by the cost of treatments. Um, so the NHS, private healthcare insurers and private healthcare providers are looking to reduce the cost of patient care for, for some of those more significant de diseases that are affecting our society. Um, and, and Source Bio are, are, are heavily linked and in partnership with some of the largest uh, clinical diagnostics companies who will utilize our services through our reference laboratory uh, under a contract for us to carry out the, the um, analysis and um, on those new panels and new tests that are coming to market and they will use us because of our accreditation and access to the NHS market. Um, so we have a we have a number of uh, new tests that are coming to, to the market. One that's just launched is a, is a test called ToxNav and this identifies cancer patients who are at high risk or of severe or potential side effects from, from the chemotherapy treatment. And ToxNav helps uh, clinicians select the safest uh, chemotherapy treatment type based on the genomic makeup of each individual patient and therefore reducing risk for the patient, improving their patient care. But from an NHS and private healthcare perspective, it drives down uh, unnecessary treatment costs. Um, and certainly it's these types of tests that we have built a portfolio with our partners to bring to market over the forthcoming months um, into the into 2021. Uh, and we see that as a really strong link between genomics and, and our histopathology reporting, as Jay has said. Great, thanks, Russell. So that's a good segue into genomics, uh, which we, we just define as a study of genes to help progress uh, drug discovery and clinical research. Uh, there are two types of DNA sequencing. Uh, there's Sanger sequencing, which was developed in the 70s, relatively old technology. However, it still remains the gold standard for, for research. In fact, most clinical research is still being done on Sanger sequencers. Uh, the one drawback of Sanger is it can only sequence one DNA strand at a time, uh, whereas next generation sequencing is massively parallel and can, can sequence millions of, uh, of, of strands at a time. So when you hear people talking about sequencing a genome, they're definitely using NGS technology. Uh, we've got both capabilities and we've centralized our our sequencing in what we call our center of excellence in Cambridge, which is ideally located for the Golden Triangle, but also a great place to attract talent and bring customers. So uh, it's, a, it's a very important part of our growth strategy for this business. Uh, we did invest in a, in a new NGS system called the Novaseq from Illumina. It's a picture of it up in the upper left there. That's uh, about a million pound investment. It, it's going to help us bring and drive larger and repeat projects. Uh, one thing that we did notice last year in 19 is that we were ex exceptionally busy. We weren't, we have never been busy in our lab. We had people asking for more staff. When we looked at the revenue and the margin numbers, it just wasn't making sense to us. What we found out was we were just doing too much work on the smaller volume or the smaller size projects and not enough on the larger projects, which are actually, which are obviously more profitable. So we've changed our approach by bringing in this Novaseq. We're able to get some of these larger projects that we weren't able to get uh, before. We did have that NGS capability, but it certainly wasn't at the level of, of this Novaseq. So that's something we're, we're really looking forward to in the coming uh, 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 year and, and years. In fact, I will say that we have implemented the Novaseq in 2019 in December. And already in Q1 of 20 before COVID, we were up 30% on prior year. So already we're seeing an impact of having a Novaseq in our arsenal, so to speak. And then as Russell touched on, this demand for personalized medicine is, is it going to accelerate with the advancements in sequencing technology. We are planning to put ourselves in sort of a niche position where we can leverage pathology and genomics in a way that not many other 
uh, providers could could offer. And I think it's going to help us from a margin perspective and just an overall project uh, scope perspective. Uh, just market dynamics growth. We, you know, one thing that's nice about this business is outsourced is preferred. You know, pharmaceutical and biotech companies don't want their staffs doing sequencing runs. They want them to look at the results of sequencing runs. So it's not it's not as if we've got to go in there and convince them to outsource. What we need to do is convince them to go to source. And what we've done is put ourselves in a position where our turnaround time is better, our, our scientific credibility is is stronger, um, our customer service is better. If you want to find out where your samples are in a particular run, you can call or you can email or you can text, and we can tell you exactly where your project is. That's there aren't many, there aren't any companies that can do that from a customer service perspective that we're competing with. Uh, we are accelerating on this personalized medicine. We talked about that, and the NGS system is improving our position. One thing I did want to highlight is we have significantly upgraded our commercial sales team in this in this space. Uh, we've got a very seasoned uh, sales uh, manager who knows the customer base, knows the business, knows how to quote, knows how to run a book and a sales team. And so she's been very, very important in, in our ability to grow this business uh, since we've kind of uh, improved our position on the NGS side. So while I say we've got you know these new projects and we were up 30% in Q1 because of the NGS system, it's also because we've got a very solid sales force helping us do this. I just want to make sure I pointed that out. And then again, refocusing our priority on, on larger projects. Uh, stability storage. Uh, let's talk about this business. Very important for our portfolio and our, uh, from a profitability perspective. Uh, stability storage is, is effectively the gateway for drugs to be released to the market. If you have a, a, a new product, it needs to be uh, put up on stability while you're developing the product to make sure the compounds remain stable. And then even when it is a drug product, you have to keep it up on stability to make sure that it remains stable. And, and even, you know, just getting into this sort of vaccine discussion now, we'll talk about it more in a bit, even when you've got, you know, parts of, of drugs that need to be controlled at minus 20 or minus 70 or five degrees C, I mean, these are, these are important part of the way drugs are released to the market. It's a highly, uh, uh, highly profitable uh, recurring revenue business of 80% gross margin, 90% recurring revenues. So very important for us. Three main revenue streams. Uh, we've got stability storage services. Uh, the picture on the upper right there is, is, a, is a photo of one of our storage facilities where customers can bring drug compounds, uh, finished product, uh, finished drugs. They store them in our facilities. They come by once a month, once a quarter, depending on the SOP, test the products to make sure they're stable. Uh, put them back in our facilities. So very, you know, very low cost business to run, uh, high value to our customer base. Uh, we also manufacture and sell storage equipment. The picture on the upper left is a photo of one of our uh, one of our pieces of kit. We do cabinets, reach-in rooms, walk-in rooms. Uh, you know, that's the original uh, basis of this business, uh, this sort of manufacturing of equipment. We still will keep this. It's an important part of the business, but increasingly it's a smaller piece of our overall revenue stream. More important is uh, the service and validation aspect to service that equipment. In fact, the service and validation side of this business is larger than the equipment side of the business, and that's likely to increase as we've got more equipment out in the field. Uh, another thing that we've done is added an analytical testing services capability to our, our lab in Tremor, where we want to, when I mentioned before about how they'll take their samples out and test them to make sure they're stable, well, what they're doing now is bringing those to, you know, outside uh, contract labs. We want to be that contract lab. It'll be much easier for our customers that they could just do it at our facility. So that's an area of growth that we're we're getting into and planning to do that across uh, across the the scope of our sto storage facilities. And certainly, the need for storage and analytical testing is increasing due to regulatory requirements. Uh, it is a very important part of releasing drugs to market, and we are very well established in the, in the in the business. We've been doing this for 30 years. We've got a very good name and reputation in the in the in the business. Uh, just some, you know, market dynamics and growth potential. One thing I wanted to point out is that these uh, these these uh, contracts are on average three years. So you have multiple types of studies from each client. You've got multiple compounds going into multiple, you know, temperature and, and humidity environments uh, for up to three years. Uh, uh, so it's 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 just a um, a business that while you know we've got contracts in place we are always getting new contracts from our customers because they're always developing new drugs and new drug compounds so it's really uh from a revenue and, and, and planning perspective uh, a solid business to uh to, to be part of uh, working with our customers on the drug development side and again you can see how there's been some cross-selling with our genomics work uh storage growth is driven by capacity so the recent investments we've made in ireland and the u.s are going to allow us to grow uh, even more we've got some increased capacity in rochdale and uh, we'll you know, in fact, Russell, why don't we talk now about the uh, 
the uh, potential business with some of this vaccine work. I think it might be good to update people on where we are with that. Uh, yes, certainly, and we've been um, we've been reaching out to uh, all of the major names that have been published looking for a, a vaccine uh, requirement. Um, and uh, obviously, our storage facilities, uh, whether in the in the US, uh, Ireland, or UK, have the capability to store product at, at minus seventeen, minus twenty, and five degree. Um, and we're we're also introducing uh, partnerships with some of our uh, known refrigeration transport groups um, and also talking about disaster recovery plans uh, for the vaccine as and when it arrives within the country. So this is something that we spotted very early on at the beginning of the pandemic and knew that there would be a requirement for a vaccine at some point to be stored in high volume. And we have another a number of opportunities that we're currently investigating uh, in discussion. Um, whether that's to take direct product and distribute um, or whether that's to offer a disaster recovery. We're trying to cover all options at the moment. Yeah, so thanks, Russell. So let's be clear. We're not, we're not putting out a revised forecast here. We're just letting you know that we are, we are working closely with companies uh, and, and working to help them as they develop these, these vaccines. Uh, let's talk about infectious disease testing. Uh, again, unprecedented business opportunity. Just some history on this. We, we went into uh, even looking at offering a COVID testing service uh, primarily as a hedge against our cellular pathology business, which we knew was likely to get uh, or be impacted by the, the slowdown in elective surgery. So I'll never forget we had a meeting in, in uh, late Feb and, and early March with the uh, exec team on, you know, what could we do to mitigate that? that. And one of the, one of the uh, solutions was coming up with a, a COVID testing business. And, you know, it was it was 50 50 in the room initially you know, there were concerns about you know staff safety. Could we go to 24 seven? Could we even gear up to do this? And I will say that after we talked it through, uh, you know, we had 100 uh, percent absolute support to do this after after the meeting was was uh, completed. The, the adrenaline and the entire organization increased uh, dramatically. We were able to put together a credible COVID antigen uh, PCR testing capability uh, very, very quickly. Uh, we quickly passed NHS and department uh, DHSC strict audit requirements. I mentioned before how we had already been audited due to our cellular pathology business, so we were able to quickly get approval. Uh, we established a strong supply chain outside of the NHS supply chain. We knew early on, and for those of you that remember, they were commandeering equipment from universities and other life sciences businesses. We want to make sure that didn't happen to us. We immediately went to some of our largest private healthcare providers and signed them up for agreements to test their staff and, and patients, and then leverage those strong relationships and, and sort of the, you know, the uh, you know, the status of those healthcare clients to, to build a, a commercial pipeline, which we're also doing. So it was, it was just a, you know, very, again, started up as a hedge against uh, cellular pathology. We had no idea how big this was going to be. And I, I can just tell you from, from an organizational perspective, everyone at source is, 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 has been working extremely hard on making this uh, uh, as large of an opportunity as it is for us right now. Uh, this actually, Russell, I'm going to give this slide to you. And I think, you can, I think this is even, we have some news that we can update since we put this presentation together. So I'm going to hand this to you, Russell, for now. Uh, yeah, well, uh, as I'm sure anybody that's uh, watching this presentation at the moment will understand just what a fast paced environment it is that we're working in. So pretty much as soon as the ink had finished drying on this slide, we were already out of date. So I'll try and update as I go along from slide to slide. However, the one thing that hasn't changed is that the antigen PCR test, uh, which is used by uh, uh, all Lighthouse Laboratories, NHS sites, and in the main, the majority of co commercial laboratories that have been under contract with the DHSC um, use this antigen PCR test. It's the only reliable clinical diagnostics test which is forming the bedrock, uh, the cornerstone um, of uh, all um, uh, clinical diagnostics testing across the globe. Um, and obviously it's the, it's the main test of, of choice um, through the uh, HM government and NHS uh, and private healthcare providers. But obviously new, new technology is coming along. Uh, the rapid point of care tests, um, which may include the uh, LAMP technology, which I'm sure some of you will have read about. Um, it is in more use than it was when we were, we were writing this, but it's predominantly being used as a screening tool in the main. Um, and whenever there is a, a spike in, in viral infection from a swab, in order to gain a clear uh, result, um, it will be an antigen PCR test. And it's worth noting at this point that the Fit to Fly program, which seems to be 
uh, very keen and certainly something that you would have seen in the news recently. Uh, the majority of countries that uh, are accepting passengers and, uh, and holiday makers are looking for a, a real-time PCR test, an antigen PCR test um, a certificate to allow them into the country, whereas some of these other uh, rapid point of care tests at the moment, as I say, are being used as a uh, as a screening tool um, with the antigen PCR behind as the bedrock. Um, antibody tests, there are some antibody tests that are currently being used predominantly in healthcare settings. Um, doesn't mean you can't spread the virus um, as advised on the gov.uk uh, website. Um, and in reality, any, any sign of, in, in, of antibody within any blood sample that's taken, that person will be referred directly on to take an antigen PCR test to see if they are infectious. Um, but there's not enough information at the moment, credible information with regards to antibody tests um, at this particular time uh, that give any strong clinical data, although that is an ever-changing landscape as, as, um, uh, as I'm sure we'll update uh, a later stage. And Moonshot, I think Moonshot at the time when we were writing this was getting an awful lot of press. Um, it is the test that's being used um, in the Liverpool program currently. Um, again, very much a screening tool. The jury is out uh, on its uh, ability to be able to pick up a low viral count. So somebody who is um, infectious um, but asymptomatic um, and that does carry a risk of false positives. So interestingly, um, uh, the program in Liverpool is that anybody that is showing any sign of infection, the first process that happens after that is that ev every single positive goes directly to an antigen PCR test in order to back up, to validate uh, the response that's getting from the moonshot use. Um, so the lateral flow tests um, uh, have been in the market for a little while. Uh, this one does seem to have some benefits, but again, it's a screening tool and the bedrock of, of uh, testing capabilities through the antigen PCR. Okay, before we go on, one thing I wanted to just highlight uh, and, and, and sort of add on to what Russell said is uh, this, this LAMP technology, uh, certainly we are taking a serious look at it. Um, we have uh, a, a system in our lab right now, we're taking a look at it, I'm not saying much about it, but we are certainly taking a look at that. From an antibody test perspective, um, we, as Russell said, right now, they're just pretty much, you know, they're not giving you a lot of information. If there were to be an antibody test that gave you quantifiable information on, on antibodies, um, we would take a serious look at it. So the, the technology is evolving. And the important point I wanted to make here is that, you know, yeah, we, we're, we're certainly doing the antigen PCR test, but we are keeping an eye on the market. We're keeping an eye on what our customers are wanting and our clients are wanting. And we're, we're, we're getting to the point where if someone wants, if there were a credible antibody test, uh, we would certainly offer it. We want to make sure the NHS supported it as well. So we are really looking at this uh, much larger than just PCR at this point. Uh, the next slide, I think the real question is how long is this going to last? Uh, this is also, uh, you know, will be impacted by some type of, of vaccine. And certainly there's additional government funding in place until March of, of 2022. It's, it's likely uh, even going to gonna go past that, to be honest. The, the, look, the vaccine, everybody wants a vaccine. Everybody certainly would want a vaccine for everyone. Um, but, but realistically, from a, from a supply chain perspective and from an execution perspective, it is going to take some time. Uh, and, and I think if, if not everyone takes the vaccine, you're still going to have some risk that you're not completely managing this pandemic. Uh, the market is moving very fast. Uh, you know, we, we've heard from, we've got a gentleman on our board uh, uh, by the name of Sir uh, Ian Crothers, who used to run the NHS. He's hearing from his people that, you know, the plan is we're going to be looking at testing for some time. Even when we get a vaccine in place, we need, we need to test to make sure the vaccine's being effective. So we're still looking at this as a, as a, you know, 2022 is when this thing really starts to tail off. I just want to make sure we highlight that. And I'll turn it over to Tony for some numbers. Thank you very much, Jay. And um, yes, so folks, I'm going to take the next four or five slides, if that's OK. So I'm going to take a slide for each business unit and just try and give you um, very much a sort of high level flavor of the financial dynamics of each business unit. And then perhaps I'll, I'll wrap the four business units together and then obviously um, pass back to Jay to, 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 um, to finish off. 
So obviously the first uh, business unit we're going to talk about healthcare diagnostics and um, hopefully as you've gathered from the earlier part of the presentation, I mean, this for us we think is the real long-term you know, excitement in the business. We see this very much as the jewel in the crown um, and that's really driven by you know, some, some pretty impressive uh, growth uh, stats. And if I point you to the, to the charts that we've got on the slide here, you can see the bottom left-hand side, this is an annual revenue growth uh, chart. You can see um, essentially 17 to 18 uh, re annual revenue growth on cellular pathology grew 40% that year, 18 to 19 it grew 40%. And in fact, in the first quarter of 2020, um, revenues actually grew uh, nearly 80% based on the, uh, on the prior year. The chart really on the right-hand side, is, again, similarly uh, tracking the growth, but this is showing, apologies, it's, it's very small font, but what this is showing is on a quarterly basis, um, actually sample throughput. And as you can see, it's very, very high volume transaction business. So we're talking about many thousands of samples per, per month and per quarter. And this is essentially showing actually a six or seven year period. And I guess if you look at maybe perhaps the halfway point, you can see sort of three years back is where it absolutely um, started to accelerate. So, you know, very much a growth business. Um, we've got to be honest, though, uh, and as Jay mentioned earlier, you know, this business has been hit by uh, COVID this year. And uh, that's really what the, uh, the, the graphic there in the middle uh, bottom middle is trying to show. So you can see that in the first quarter uh, of this year, that's the the, the bold uh, bold bar bar sections. Um, you know, business really going like a train. You know, significant growth on on prior year. Obviously, COVID hits at the end of March, and we've got a very very quiet uh, Q2. Um, honestly, we kind of thought the business was coming back to us um, early Q3, and you know, as we all know. Uh, COVID's come for a second bite, so you know that that isn't quite as sustained, perhaps as we, as we hoped it might be. But you know, the important thing is, in our mind, this is not lost business. So this all comes back to the the waiting list and the backlog, and you know, it's very very much in the public domain. Um, you know, the size of this, and the truth is, of course, it's getting bigger every single day. So in our mind, this is essentially giving us more uh, visibility, more comfort um, to support actually some pretty ambitious. Um, you know, revenue forecast going, you know, going forward when it does come back to us. And again, I'll highlight the point that Jay and Russell made uh, made earlier. You know, we're now in the um, in the framework agreement, so I think we're in the ideally place to essentially capitalise on that when it does come back to us. And you know, clearly this is a very scalable, um, high volume transaction business. Just to give you a flavour of margins, I mean, it's essentially it's a 40% margin business, gross margin business. That's what we've enjoyed in the past. But what we can do is we can see, you know, significant upside, I think, on that in the coming years. And part of that is just naturally through through scale and more volume that will drive margin growth. But also, again, I'd, I'd refer you back to the comments Jay made about uh, implementing digital technology, because that has the ability to save the physical transportation of tissue samples, uh, which saves on the carriage costs. And it also allows, obviously, the shortening of turnaround times. Um, which again uh, can drive uh, significant further throughput. So we're, we're very bullish about this going forward. Cellular pathology actually last year was about a quarter of the total revenue of the business. We see it actually post COVID sort of steady state, this should be more like half or slightly more than half of our total business. So that's why we're you know, very excited about this part of the business. Okay, so uh, the next uh, business uh, section, genomics. Um, again, so just picking up some of the points uh, uh, Jay made before. I mean, we've got a graphic here. We've got the pie chart showing showing our customer mix, and clearly we're focusing very much uh, in terms of uh, the deeper wallets that are, that are held by biotechs rather than uh, academia, which actually, interesting, is a switch from perhaps three or four years ago when it was the other way around. But again, coming back to the growth, um, you can see here that um, we're, we're obviously separating the Sanger sequencing business from the NGS, the next generation sequencing. What we're seeing here is strong, consistent growth between 10 and 20% per annum on the on the Sanger based business and that's fine um, and again just picking up a point uh, Jay made the the NGS did miss a beat in 2019 and it's really explained by the the graphic here that we're showing on the bottom right hand side so you can see see in all honesty that in 2019 after a bit of analysis it became very clear that yes we were busy but we were focusing very much on the lower ultra low value projects um, which clearly have um, you know less revenue and less margin, and certainly not enough time on the larger projects. And interestingly, we have uh, obviously we've made that investment 
um, in the technology, which is great, but we have seen the fruits of that already um, in, uh, in uh, 2020. And you can see here the bar chart, obviously, it's only up to Q3, but you can see that the mix has started to turn around. So we can see that that's starting to work. And I think, I think that's also reinforced when we talk about margins. So certainly on the Sanger part of the business, that's historically been uh, essentially a 50% gross margin business, which is fine. Um, on NGS, I'm afraid 2019 was a rather sad 8% uh, growth margin, which is really where our problem was. But what we're seeing already is that we're tracking to around about 30% um, up to Q3 of this year. So, yeah, admittedly, we've got a way to go, but we've absolutely turned the corner. And we've certainly um, essentially reversed the, the mix of business, which was key to us. And I think the other thing um, that I've got to say about uh, gen uh, genomics is that uh, unlike cell pathology, um, yes, we had a quiet Q2, but importantly, the business has come back to us from July onwards. In other words, we're back in the game, and yes, we had a dip, dip for three months whilst uh, COVID hit, but importantly, our customers are now trading as normal to pre-COVID levels. And this is a traditional pipeline-driven business, so we've essentially got pretty good uh, visibility going forward of meeting forecasts and, and obviously building up uh, pipelines, etc. Okay. The uh, third business unit I'm going to talk about here is the stability storage piece. And again, just picking up on some of the points that Jay raised earlier, um, there are three components, or historically have been three components, and that's the revenue mix pie chart there. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that the most important one for us is very much stability storage service. So you can see here it's essentially half of the total revenue, and this is where clients are leaving their product with us in our facilities under these long-term contracts. Um, so the reason we're interested is, yes, it's half the business, but importantly, it's very, very high margin. So it's essentially an 80% gross margin business. You can see that um, on the chart there, the bottom left-hand side. Um, and it's also worth noting that it's been completely robust through, uh, through the COVID. So obviously, it's long-term sticky contracts. Um, there's no reason why clients are going to remove product from us, um, you know, given whatever's happening in the world. They are sticky contracts. Um, high margin and importantly giving us very good revenue visibility and in fact the way we look at revenue visibility um, I guess we you know define recurring and and repeat and we look at it as a business uh, unit as a whole um, and under that basis we essentially get 90% visibility across the, the whole business and really it's underpinned by that stability storage piece so just coming back to the other components of the the revenue mix obviously the storage is the big one uh, manufacturing is clearly the small, smallest one, and in fact, to be quite honest, in you know, in the scale of the business, it's becoming smaller and smaller in percentage terms, clearly. But it's still strategically interesting for us because it really drives the service revenue. So whilst we have a bigger installed base um, of, of systems out there, clearly it gives us more scope to uh, to sell service and validation contracts, and they are typically 50% uh, gross margin business. So that's good business to have, really. Okay, so the um, the final um, final business unit infectious uh, disease testing. Um, so I mean, obviously, what we've got here is um, you know a, a very rapid growth, as as you've uh, I think you've established. You know, we started this in May. We've progressively grown uh, this business um, up to actually 5,150 tests per month in September. Um, in fact, our target in September was four and a half thousand tests per, uh, per day. Um, and in fact, what I can say in October is that we had a target of 6,000 tests per day, and in fact, we've um, delivered about 7,200 roughly per day um, in October. So I think what you're sensing is here we are pushing as hard as we can to maximize um, our capacity internally and obviously maximize throughput. It's very much um, you know, demand-driven here. And I think it's also worth pointing out that this has been very much, again, a modular growth so to get up to this level of capacity, uh, you may be surprised to hear we've actually spent only about a million pounds of capex on, in terms of bits of kit, et cetera. Um, incidentally, all of which is reusable, you know, when we come out the other end and, um, you know, no longer need to be in this, this particular business. It's all reusable kit. Um, we spent about 300,000 uh, fitting out a laboratory um, actually in, um, in August. And that really explains why perhaps there's a slight dip in the shape of the curve here. We started off this business in a small laboratory on our sort of ground floor premises in Nottingham. Uh, and that got us to um, essentially about 3,000 tests a day. Um, 
we we refitted the the first floor laboratory clearly far larger capacity and we made the move upstairs in august so clearly that's why there's a slight dip in, dip in august so you know it's been very much a modular growth in terms of uh, building the team we've got about 80 people dedicated to this uh, business essentially all on short-term contracts so in the same way that we've managed the growth um, up the curve uh, we're confident that we can steadily manage the growth as we come down the curve and i think it's been very clear in terms of i'm not going to give forecasts but it's been very clear um, in terms of where our sort of ambition is here clearly we're going to push as hard as we possibly can um, we're very keen to get to ten and a half thousand tests um, certainly by uh, by the year end and ideally earlier but that's key and we're going to push as hard as we can to to maximize throughput i think that's clear so um again we've been quite uh, um public i think in terms of the the sort of revenue potential of this again i'm not going to give numbers but you know typically average selling prices have been around about 40 pounds per test um there are some customers who are paying significantly more than that so i'll let you do the maths but again i think the important thing to note is that um, you know, typically it's a 40% gross margin business. So this is producing very significant revenues, uh, very significant earnings, and very significant cash generation. And obviously, what we do with that, I'll leave to Jay to discuss um, shortly. Um, but you know, that that's uh, very much key to, key to us going forward. I think in terms of the sort of size and shape of the the curve, I think again, I'll just reinforce the point Jay made. I mean, we see this certainly accelerating as fast as, as, as possible and perhaps peaking potentially mid-2021 and then a slow decline after that through 2022. I mean, that's our baseline in terms of um, assumptions, but, you know, clearly, um, you know, there is upside, you know, if it potentially lasts longer. Okay, just a, just a minute to, um, to perhaps bring the three, uh, sorry, the four business units together on this slide i mean clearly that these are historic financials um and i think a couple of points worth mentioning i mean i think hopefully the first point is that i think you've realized is i mean this has been very much a, a turnaround situation so there's been a lot of hard work done in those earlier years um uh, but that has all been done i think that's the first point and i think the second observation is clearly um you know we expect the future numbers to look dramatically uh, different from this historic numbers that we're presenting here clearly we expect revenue across all business units. I think the, uh, the infectious disease testing uh, row there, I think that's probably the most obvious one to, to see dramatic growth in. But clearly, I think we, you know, hopefully we've presented, you know, growth opportunities, particularly in healthcare diagnostics. So that's the cell pathology, and that's the, you know, coming to the return, the tsunami of, uh, of the backlog coming to us. Genomics, I think that's hopefully clear. And stability storage, I think, to be honest, we're not going to see huge spikes of revenue growth uh, in this because what we're selling is a recurring service so it's not unlike a, um, a software um, software as a service SaaS business we're overlaying small slices of annuity revenue as we sell new business so we see attractive growth going forward you know across the board and i think the other point is we're very focused on building the bottom line and the cash generation obviously faster than the the top line so you can see we've come some way eight percent to fourteen percent in two years I think it's fair to say we think there's a you know a fair way to go on this. I mean, there's no reason in our mind why you know steady state post the sort of the COVID peak there shouldn't be a 20% EBITDA business obviously on 20% um, plus on you know significantly more volume. So you know that's our aspirations going forward. Back to you, Jay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tony. Uh, we wanted to cover this barriers entry. I call it economic advantage. Um, so as a as a sort of a contract uh, lab business. We don't, we don't have R&D. We don't have IP. We don't have patents. Uh, it would be very difficult for us to do that. We're working for our customers. So whenever we do work for customers on drug development, it's, it's our customers' patents. Uh, but what we do have is a highly regulated environment we're operating in with very high standards of meat accreditations, and we've got all of those in both the U.S., Ireland, and, and, and the United States. We are deeply embedded with the NHS, as we showed or demonstrated from the cellular pathology side, moving into the, the uh, uh, COVID testing business, as well as getting into the, uh, the framework for the uh, elective surgeries, uh, to, you know, again, just shows the strength of our relationship with the NHS. Highly trained, educated staff with significant know-how, uh, not easily duplicated. A significant investment in, in new technology. Well, we've done that. We will continue to do that. 
We've got a very uh, well-established market position. Uh, we are trusted uh, to deliver high-quality results, and we've got very good customer service, and, and that is important to this customer base. When you're a pharmaceutical company dealing with drug development, you need to make sure you're working with a with a with a highly accredited, uh, you know, quality business. And we think we've got a very good position in the marketplace. Organic growth strategies. Just very quickly, we've touched on some of these within the different uh, discussions of the business units, but just healthcare diagnostics. We talked about driving digital pathology. That's going to grow both our margins and our, 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 our capacity. Target private health care providers more. There's, you know, there's opportunities to get into London that we could pursue that would give us more of a space in, 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 the, in the private health care market in London. Uh, expand our oncology specialties. Right now, we offer the breadth, but we're primarily skin and GI. We could get into lung, bowel, other areas, uh, certainly an area to, to, to consider. Uh, genomics, we talked about this personalized bridge uh, uh, a medicine bridge to pathology. We will continue to focus on that. Uh, expand our presence in Ireland and the U.S., which we are doing now. In fact, what I failed to mention is we just put a sequencing uh, lab in Dublin, and we're already seeing more work in, in, out of Ireland than we've seen for for, for uh, many years. We had a, a sequencing lab in Tremor. It seemed to not be the right location to, to secure new business, so we put a small lab in Dublin, and we're already seeing significantly increased genomics uh, and sequencing work out of out of Ireland. And then again, focusing on high value niche projects uh, is, is sort of where we're going to position ourselves in the market. Stability storage. Oh, sorry, I was going to finish that. Uh, stability storage, Ireland, U.S. expansions. We've talked about that. Uh, increasing our service cap capability in the U.S. Right now, we've only got two or three people uh, servicing our equipment, and they can only do really call outs and preventative maintenances. We don't have service contracts. Uh, if we, you know, we could contract out and, and sort of, uh, you know, third party the service capability in the U.S. and get service contract revenue, which would be, uh, you know, very good to expand our, our, our capability and revenues there. And obviously continue to upgrade our, our uh, technology, which we are doing. And then lastly, infectious disease, uh, leverage our lab expansions. There are things we are doing, which we really won't talk about today, that could give us significantly more capacity. Uh, increase focus on the private market and then expand our services offering, as we discussed, with the potential of other tests beyond just PCR. And this next slide is, is important here, uh, the acquisition approach and strategy. One thing we want to make sure, and we made this clear uh, going through the IPO process, is that, you know, we are certainly going to be generating a lot of cash through this uh, COVID opportunity, and we are going to be extremely disciplined on, on acquisitions. We are not just going to, to acquire to acquire. Uh, you, know, we, uh, you know, I've done this before at Celsius. We have a process in place. Uh, we do a market analysis. We do initial screen. We do a secondary screen. You know, business fit, likely focusing on our healthcare business, possibly genomics if it helps us bridge into healthcare. You know, we want strong growth. We want positive cash. We want EBITDA growth. We want to have, a, you know, a creative timing that's that's very favorable. Strength of management team is important. Uh, you know, we've got a small universe of targets already identified. I mentioned the potential of, of possibly getting more into uh, the London private uh, 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 hospital space. Uh, we've got further U.S. expansions into cell path and healthcare diagnostics. We've got other oncology specialties we could also acquire. Uh, there are a few infectious disease businesses that are well beyond just COVID uh, that have very solid uh, relationships in place with various governments around the world that we have taken a look at. It's something that we might want to consider. So I just want to make it clear that we are we are going to be disciplined uh, in, in, in acquiring. But the other thing we wanted to point out was if we're sitting in the middle of 21 and we haven't really executed on some of these in any big way, we certainly would consider a special dividend or a share buyback program. So we're, we're really leaving everything on the table as we grow our, our, our cash position. And I think to summarize, uh, Source is a leading provider of laboratory services to the pharmaceutical industry, NHS, and private hospitals. We are, have invested in and are well positioned to grow in our base businesses. Um, cellular pathology, uh, genomics and stability storage. Uh, we've got international reach that's likely to increase. Uh, we've got strong EBITDA margins driven by uh, competitive advantage. Uh, unprecedented short and long-term opportunity with this COVID uh, activity uh, driven by, you know, limited uh, uh, supply for high demand. Uh, there still is just simply not enough uh, a supply to meet demand. And then again, the IPO uh, certainly gives us the opportunity to invest, invest in our, our COVID testing business, uh, capital restructure, and fund future strategic development. So that's sort of the summary of, uh, of, of Source Bio. 
Jay, thank you very, very much indeed. And, and also to Russell uh, and to, to Tony. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the company take a few moments to review questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A will be available on your Investor Meet company dashboard. And finally, before I do turn to the q and I'd like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company and immediately post the conclusion of the meeting, you'll be redirected for the opportunity uh, to provide feedback in order that the company can understand your views and expectations. Um, Jay, um, uh, Russell, Tony, obviously the investors had the ability to pre-submit questions. I've got five. I am pretty mindful of time as we come up to the hour and you've also had quite a few questions come in uh, during the event itself. Um, so if we could get through these, I know you would have touched on these as well within the presentation, but perhaps where you can add a, a little bit more clarity. Um, the first question is, given the recent news on COVID vaccines, how do you see this affecting the company? And given the recent tenders from UK government in regards to COVID, are the company looking to tender in this sphere? Uh, I, to answer the last question, it simply is, uh, is yes, we are and we have. And, uh, you know, I think from a vaccine perspective, I've touched on that. But, Russell, why don't you give some flavor into what we're doing with the government and some of the programs we're, we're helping develop? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, there are a number of different uh, opportunities that we are looking at uh, with the Department of Health and Social Care. Uh, we have entered the uh, National Microbiology Framework um, tender that is there. Um, but we're also looking at ways in which we can... Um, utilize some of the technologies that we talked about um, for our, everything from uh, rapid uh, point of care tests. Um, we're looking at um, the LAMP technology uh, and we're looking at abilities to be able to take that out into the community a little bit more. <clears throat> I, don't, I can't talk too much about that at this present moment in time, but ultimately we are looking uh, um, at, um, or the DHSC are looking at, at source bioscience because of our high accreditation to UCAS ISO 15189 uh, medical laboratory accreditations um, for the COVID test. And there are very few commercial laboratories that are able to, to quote that statement. And therefore we have uh, a significant benefit to the Department of Health and Social Care, the NHS, private healthcare, and the other clientele that you, you, you've seen today. Uh, from a vaccine perspective, to answer that particular question, um, that vaccines are very important. We believe, obviously, it will be a slow uh, rollout, um, as well as obviously a, a challenge for, for supply. Um, vaccines are good, but look, there's 15 million patients that need um, a form of, of elective surgery, that need treatment inside a hospital, um, and clinical processes need a clinical diagnostics test in order to not only test the patients into a hospital prior to treatment, but also out of a hospital after treatment, and all of the frontline staff that are there. And whilst there's new technologies coming through, um, the bedrock, as we've always said, of, of um, a clinical diagnostics trusted test is the antigen PCR test. And our relationships with private healthcare and NHS um, give us a particular strength in making that statement. Uh, thank you. Um, it, that actually leads on nicely to the second question, which is given the recent raise for scale up of COVID PCR, how does the company see vaccines affecting the profitability and will the margins from PCR be reinvested into M&A? Well, I mean, the answer is uh, yes, uh, as, I, as I, I touched on that acquisition slide a bit ago, but I think the one thing we've been trying to point out during this presentation is certainly PCR is a very important uh, technology for testing during this COVID pandemic. PCR is not going away. You're going to need a PCR test. And I think when people think about the amount of testing that's going on, and we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of tests a day, um, you know, we're only providing, you know, we're looking to provide, you know, whatever the number would be. And the forecast is 10, five a day. Uh, you're going to need PCR testing. There is going to be a need for other types of tests. We're certainly looking at other types of tests. So we're not seeing this. If anything, I'm more uh, bullish on this opportunity now, even with the vaccine, because that means there's going to be even more need for testing because we want to look at the efficacy of the, of the, of the vaccine. So for us, um, we're doing all we can to make sure we are staying on top of this uh, pandemic and working very closely with the DHSC on ways we can help them you know, roll out the testing 
uh, capabilities the way they, they are planning to do. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, will the company be looking at the storage market for the recent vaccines and, and Pfizer, given that this could now be a very lucrative market for you? Yes, I mean, we, you know, again, without announcing an, an agreement, we are talking to Pfizer and all the major companies looking at the vaccine. Uh, you know, we're one of the few companies that have the storage capability to be able to do this on a larger scale. Uh, so we're, we're, you know, we're cautiously optimistic about the ability to help with that aspect of this uh, vaccine rollout as well. Um, just mindful of time, if I just jump to, to this pre-submitted question, are investors correct in their assumption that uh, Source Bio has no IP patent protection, so it's wholly reliant upon its supply chain? Well, I think I touched on that in the, uh, the uh, barriers entry slide. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have IP. We've always said that. But what we do have is a very uh, high-quality offering uh, that resonates with, uh, with our customers and the, and the, and the government. Okay. Well, that that, uh, I think, that. I mean, one thing we could take. I'm oh, sorry, Mark. No, carry on, Jay, please. No, no, no. I mean, yeah, I was going to see. Do we want to take some of these other questions? Yeah, from, I, I was going to say. Obviously, the investors have submitted questions during the live event. If I could just ask you to ensure that you can see the Q and A tab, and and if you could start at the top. If I could ask you to read out perhaps who the questions from and the question itself, and then give your response where it's appropriate. That'd be great. Thanks ever so much, Jay. Okay, well, there's one from uh, Craig M. What plans do you have to ex expand beyond PCR testing and antibodies? And I think there's another question on antibodies below by Craig. Same. Okay, Craig, so you're, you're interested in antibodies. Uh, we're not offering an antibody test yet. Uh, so there, there are, there, you know, there is one in particular we're taking a serious look at that might give quantitative uh, uh, data on antibodies. And if that were to be the case, and you could, uh, you could uh, claim that, it might be very helpful if you've got a vaccine, then you could test the efficacy of that using an antibody test to determine whether or not your antibodies are up or they're not up or they're at a certain level where you might not need the vaccine. So it is, it is, it is a, an area we're looking at. We're, we're taking a serious look at it. Um, and certainly the economics would have to make sense before we get into it. But, yeah, we're, we're looking at, at, uh, at the opportunity to do, uh, a, a, I would say, a more credible antibody test. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a question from Andrew R. about our contract with Spire that expired. I will say, Andrew R., yes, we have uh, renewed the contract. We are very pleased with the contract, and we're not going to get into a lot of details on the contract. Um, are we seeing interest from the university sector and COVID also from Andrew R.? Uh, I, I mean, a bit. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the core of our business. Uh, and then we did, we got a, a question from Stephen P. on margins. I think Tony talked about that being, you know, 40 Forty percent plus margin business. Um, uh, let me see. There's a lot of questions here. I'm not going to be able to answer all these. Jay, wh wh why don't you look to to maybe jump on a couple, and then um, obviously we'll be have be able to to review all of these yeah. meeting and and publish responses back to all the attendees on the call, and just to assure all uh, investors that have submitted questions that they are uh, presented to the company with the ability to respond. Yeah, we certainly will. I mean, these are these are all very good questions, but there's so many, and I, I, I hesitate to start cherry picking these. Um, one question is on the debt, and I think there was a pre-submitted question on the, on the debt and and the uh, sort of managing that with the IPO. I mean, the, and I'd really like to explain this because I think it's important. I mean, when we took the company private, there was a bridge loan for about 13 million pounds that was put in place that was supposed to have been refinanced uh, immediately after we went private. Uh, when we came in uh, and realized the business was not performing as advertised. Uh, and the results that year were so far below what we had uh, forecasted, it was not possible to refinance that debt. So we've been carrying a very expensive mezzanine debt uh, starting at 13, carrying it forward uh, all the way till now. So that became uh, prohibitively you know, hard for us to grow the business beyond uh, just basic needs until we cleared out that debt. That was a big, that was one of the reasons we did the IPO. Additionally, certainly f funding the COVID activity was was the, was the main reason i just wanted to make sure like to clear out that was the, what the debt was uh with with the shareholder loans that that's brilliant jay um well look um i think it makes sense at that point perhaps just to to ask you to to finally wrap up um i know investor feedback is important and all the investors in the call can provide that to you directly um at the end uh, when we disconnect so if i could just ask you to wrap up that would be fantastic jay thank you 
Well, look, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming in and for submitting all these questions. We will definitely get back to everyone on these questions and make sure we've answered them uh, appropriately. And I can, I, I, as I hope you uh, are, are, uh, are, are getting from the presentation, we are very bullish on the business uh, and the opportunities ahead of us. And we are looking forward to uh, uh, delivering more and more as we move the company forward. Well, that's very kind. Thank you very much indeed to both uh, to Jay, Tony and Russell for, for updating uh, investors today. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback. If you access this from our platform, uh, the feedback form will appear. Uh, if you access this via the link in the email, you'll simply be asked to log back in and hit the feedback page straight away. We'd be very grateful um, if you could do that, please. Um, so on behalf of um, Jay, Tony and Russell and the, the management team of uh, Source Bioscience International PLC, I'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.